Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Mental Rental. That's right. A show that we put together just for our, our Patreon over at Legion Podcast. There is a couple episodes already out there, but we, just like the Phoenix, Phoenix rising from the ashes, we decided to do this once a month. <laughs> uh, or as time permits. Right. So uh, I'm Rick, one of your hosts, and beside me, my partner with this, this with this show is the guy that uh, the reason the lyrics for nothing else, nothing compares to you. It's Court Psyops. What's up, brother? That's on. That's only because I shaved my head, just like Sinead, You know, that's that's all cool. But I was gonna come in with a William Devane line. Like, I just oh. I got to do this, right? No, no, man, pull up harder, like harder, till you hear the bones crack. Man. I can't wait to talk about this flick. This is such a fucking crazy man, movie. Man, this movie. And I really like the idea of what we're doing with this because we're really not covering the stuff everybody else does. And this movie right here, man, it it, it taught me one thing is you don't want to mess with, with William Devane. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> definitely, definitely made me a fan. Yeah, uh, this is, uh, I came to this rather late. I actually only got to see Rolling Thunder, I think, in like a bootleg version. There's a now defunct bootleg label out there that was called Cinema Day Bazaar, and they got everything. Wow. Anything you needed to get, they could get their hands on just about anything for you. And of course, you paid through the nose, and most things looked great. Some things looked like shit, but that's how I first saw this, is they they were selling a copy of it um, that I think was like... Uh, I think it was like a VHS rip or something. And then it got a, like a small DVD release, but I never got a chance to pick that one up. Uh, I came to this film really, really late, wow. but like I can't imagine what it would have been like to see this in drive-ins or I, theaters, like even a hard top at the time of its release. I saw it at a drive-in. Uh, not oh, not during release. It was a little later on, and it was double billed. I can't remember. It's it another, like, I want to say it was The Exterminator. Um Oh God! This would be perfect with the exterminator. Yeah. yeah, that would be a great double bill. I mean, this is this is when I think drive-in, and I think of the kind of movies that I used to catch at the drive-in when I was a kid. Um, it's definitely th this fits yes. so yes. well with it. And I I started drive-in life much much later. Like I came into drive-ins at the at their decline mm. in like the the late eighties to early nineties as a kid is when drive-ins started becoming a thing. For yeah. me, anyway. And um, there was a drive-in. I grew up in a, like, we were just talking about living rural life, and I grew up in a really, really small mountain town. And there was this drive-in that basically never returned the prints of movies that were <laughs> sent to them from these companies. Like, they would, they would, I don't know how they got away with it, because they were so far up in the mountains where I lived, you know, like in the Appalachia. I guess the distributors were scared to go up and try and collect the print. <laughs> You know, um, so like this drive in like had all these like old school movie prints and they would just have like these crazy dust to dawn marathons That's awesome. uh, in, in, in my hometown. And like I would see all of these fucking movies that like I never even knew existed, all this crazy, insane shit. And it was like six bucks you could walk on Man. like someone could drop you off at the drive in and there was like, I don't know, like outdoor seating seats or like a pavilion seat kind of thing that you could sit and watch Sweet. it or Later on, when friends would drive or, or whatever, you know, I, I would hitch, hitch rides and everything. But literally, like, I would just get dropped off and they'd be like, all right, be safe. Don't leave the place till it's over. We'll be here to pick you up in the morning. And it was fucking amazing. Is this, is this still <laughs> the age with the little small speaker? Or did you already have it to where it was just synced up to your radio? Did you have a. Uh, it, it was definitely like the 80s, the late 80s, early 90s. It was definitely, you know, the, the radio thing. Wow. And like I don't want I don't want to make it sound like my parents dropped me off there when I was like ten years old by myself, <laughs> you know. Um, sometimes like a, a family member would take me. Sometimes my family would go or, or something like that, you know. But uh, that's where I got an appreciation of a lot of this kind of stuff because there'd be things that my dad saw when he was a kid that they'd be playing a print of that I'm sure they didn't have the right to play. Oh, yeah. Like they were probably just pirate playing it because I mean, like again, it's the fucking mountains. What are they going to do? do? Right. Yeah. Right. Let's and watch Boggy so Creek again for the fortieth time. <laughs> right, right, yeah, and there was a lot of public domain shit going on, and that's where I developed a love of those kinds of yeah. movies that, like, most other people, like, you know, nobody nobody else that I know of in this world loves Brianna Meat Hook. They think it's a terrible movie, <laughs> but I love it. Like, I can't get enough of it because, like, that's what was available where I grew up in those kinds of video stores, yeah. and Rolling Thunder so fits with that. Like, yep. it's, it's like the, the quintessential drive-in flick and it's no wonder it was such a huge influence on tarantino oh, yeah. and he even named his company after it yeah. 
for his releasing and all of that stuff. Like, it's it's so just such a great fucking design of a film. And the weird thing about it is it's not even horror. It's just straight yeah. straight fucking drama yeah. of this man's life. And it's got a little like Death Wish influence to it. And this came out after Death Wish, did it not? Uh, it's really close, actually. I don't know. I'd have to look at that. They're definitely contemporaries, and sure. I just kind of wonder if it's a chicken or an egg situ- situation. Like, which one? Because obviously, Death Wish was a book, but like this was in the zeitgeist yes. in people's minds because the crime was on the rise. People were, you know, trying to make ends meet in the seventies, and you know, excess was starting to roll in, and and just becomes like this perfect touchstone, right? right? And uh, Jesus, let's just play yeah, it, right? Because yeah. I mean, <laughs> might as yeah. well. We can say all this while we're watching it, but yeah. So the court's got the the laydown of how this is going to work. If you have your own copy of this, I'm gonna let him describe it to you because he had to describe it to me. <laughs> all right. Now I know that different edits of this and different versions of it that are out there, and I think there's even some versions on YouTube for people that you know may be interested in that sort of thing. Um, but basically, there's different cuts of it, and. Uh, what I am watching, and I think what Rick is also watching, is the uh, Blu-ray release that Shout Factory did not too long mm-hmm. ago. And that release starts with an MGM logo, which is technically like the disc logo, because other versions of it just kick in right away with the AIP logo. So if you have that copy, or if your DVD has the MGM logo from the old DVD that you're watching, and you see the MGM logo pop up at the beginning, skip ahead about nine seconds. Uh, right at nine seconds, there should be a slightly dim, dark AIP logo without the words AIP, just the circle with the A and the I inside of it uh, with a little like tra- registered trademark. That's about nine seconds in. And for most people, the version that they're used to um, that they may have seen somewhere else or like that bootleg that I had, that's where it starts. So that's where we're starting is right there, yeah. right before AIP actually starts up. And so, uh, Rick, if you want to do the countdown for the play for everybody, that should get them synced up, and we'll be good to go. So, And I'll hit play right as you say. Okay. Well, I'll say three, two, one, play. So here we go. Three, two, one, play. Yeah, yeah. So now it lightens up. There it is. Yep. Yeah. And American International. There's the words. We're good to go. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So yeah, I mean, everything you were describing earlier, you're exactly right. This is, this is Grindhouse, even though it's not overloaded Grindhouse. Yeah, I completely agree. It's funny. Uh, my favorite movie of all time also starts with the San Antone song, and it has the same dramatic effect of bringing you into the mindset of these characters that we're, huh. we're working with and we're living with here. And um, the intro of Ninth Configuration, when they're playing mm-hmm. the song San Antone, the character's sitting by himself, and he's... Um, he, he's actually, like, you know, there's, like, sadness in his eyes. He's... Uh, He's just kind of sitting, staring out the window, and then it shows you the environment of he's living in, in this this castle and everything. And it's it's essentially this overture without credits or anything else, and then the credits of the movie start. And in this case, this part of it really feels like it should be an overture, too, but they put the credits over top right. of it. Ooh, Barry DeVryzen. <laughs> Batman did the score for uh, The Warriors. Yeah. He, excellent, excellent score. So we're in we're in good hands. Here. Uh, but anyway, also just this feels just because I mean we're not even I mean Chris we're talking about William Devane, but did you see? I mean look at the list of of people that are in this movie. The actors yeah. is is a really top notch list. And yeah, there's some there's some folks that would go on to do some amazing stuff that are in this film, and it's either their first or extremely earliest role. I don't know of a a role that Tommy Lee Jones got before this. To be honest, yeah, I don't either. Uh, so, and I'm sure that he did have roles. Oh, screenplay by Paul Schrader. That's the guy who wrote Taxi Driver. Yep. Jesus, no wonder it gets so fucking dark. <laughs> All right. It's been forever since I've watched this, so this is oh. really, really exciting. I'm going to geek out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can't think of anything I've seen Tommy Lee Jones in before this, and I've never seen William Devane with uh, his natural young hair color. Right. 
Like he's always been a gray haired man. That's like almost as George Hamilton tanned as George Hamilton, right. you know, yep. <laughs> selling life insurance or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Or, or uh, being a foil to uh, uh Mel Gibson in Payback. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love him in that role. Payback's another movie I think doesn't get mm. enough appreciation. Absolutely. Adapted from the Parker novels. Yeah, I just feel like all this intro here where the music plays and then the people are waiting for them to come in, we should get this as like a coda to tell you what's going on with San Antonio and where he's coming back. Yeah. Uh, and then we should have the credits over some other stuff because there's some moments in the film that doesn't have dialogue and they're like quiet moments where he's trying to get used to being home. And I think that's kind of where I would have put the credits, but that's like armchair directing, you know, because this, this moment, I know I'm talking over it and everything. This moment is so poignant and such, uh, so like touching for what he's going through. And, you know, they, they cover a lot of it with the credits and people kind of check out when credits are on the screen, you know, you want them to hear and feel these moments. That's my thought. Yeah, I think it's, you know, they're trying to pack as much of what's happening into this movie as possible. So even through the credits, you're getting the story of, you know, POWs coming back from from captivity and getting the heroes welcome. And you can already tell just from the in the plane, these guys are, they're still shaken. They're still broken. Oh, yeah. PTSD was not something that we really knew what to refer to it as. And they had various terms to for it, like shell shock and things like yeah. that, that didn't even cover what it actually was. And clearly someone who was in a POW camp is going to need additional support. They're going to need, um, you know, some mental health and things like that. And these guys are just basically like they're handed a big thank you and like this hero's welcome. And then they're like, yeah, yeah go back go, to your life. You fuck. Thing. And they just abandon them. Right. Yeah. They just completely abandon them. Yep. And it, you know, I had family and friends, well, not friends, but I had family and friends of my family who served in Vietnam and who they, we have physically survived it and came back. But a part of them was always there. And it's something that I think movies dealt with a lot better in the time frames like the late seventies when it was in the consciousness more than what we really kind of deal with it now yeah. with some of the soldiers, even though it's more recognized now, I think people don't want to tell the stories of what some of these men and women went through. Right. And I, I think that's a shame. Uh, just like this, having, having uh, William Devane come up and do the talking because look at Tommy Lee Jones, man, you can tell this is the guy you don't want to go up and talk on the mic. <laughs> Cause he may he may reveal a bit too much. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely all soldier all the time. He's a man of extremely few words and all actions. And they've been gone so long he doesn't even know his own son. Like it's yeah, been yeah. 7 years they've been POWs, right? Like the war was over and they finally got them released like 6 or 7 years later. And how about uh how about our character here? I just it's it's unusual to see him not in a wheelchair, right? From Texas Chainsaw. <laughs> yeah, that is Franklin. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the guy that just gave him the hug that's supposed to be his dad, that's the guy that runs the chainsaw store in Chainsaw 2. I shit you oh, not, I just saw him. Wow. Who? <laughs> yeah, the, the one that was hugging Tommy Lee Jones. Is that Daphne Coleman? Yes, Daphne Coleman, yep. Holy shit, yeah, there is a lot of names. Daphne was like the king of the 80s. He oh, was in like everything. Oh. You couldn't turn a movie on on HBO and him not be in it. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it seems like only people that watched like crappy cable in the 80s really liked Daphne Coleman. <laughs> like you and me. Hey. Different eras of drive-in, but we're both drive-in kids and we're both obsessed with the HBO. I'll, I'll take his performance <laughs> in Modern Problems any day. <laughs> oh, God, that movie's great. We got to do that one on Mental Run. Sure. Man. That one is going to be awesome. <laughs> The demon powder scene alone, oh, we're going to have so much fun with. The, the ballerina's pants blowing up. I mean, just <laughs> everything about it. <laughs> the, blo the bloody nose of the guy oh, that's dating his ex. That's great. So, yeah, man, you can already tell. Tommy Lee Jones is like, I don't, I don't know what to do. <laughs> well, and I don't want to, I won't name names or anything like that, but I have an uncle who is still very much how Tommy Lee Jones's character yeah. is. Yeah, I mean... From being in Nam and from serving, like, he's still, like, got that, like, not dead behind the eyes, but that sort of always surveying for the next possible threat, never really relaxed 
yeah. feel to everything they say and do and the way that they position their body. And it's Tommy Lee Jones is playing that masterfully. Yeah. Like, I don't know if he's gotten any experience with that kind of trauma, but like it is very clearly displayed and it's subtle to where if you're not paying attention and you don't know what to look for, you won't notice it. But I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you have experience with veterans as oh, well. Yes, and, yeah. and that's things that you've noticed Oh yeah, from friends or family members that have served. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, of course I had a, a best friend that had, had an uncle that, I mean, he would, he would snap pretty easily, you know, and, and react to things and yeah, it's pretty, pretty scary. And then you understand why, you know, oh, I want to say too these, these uh, sheets, the comforter and everything on this bed. Every kid uh-huh. I knew back at this time had these sheets, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the, I was just going to comment on the paneling wall, and mm. then the um, it was it. What's the type of rug where they they use the various scraps of material and they hook right. them together and knot them? Yeah. But that's the type of rug that's on the floor. I had my grandmother, my great grandmother, and uh, some of my aunts make those or, or made those during their lifetime, and some of them still make them to these days. Like these just make these grand rugs and that's how people got them in their cabins right. and things like that is they would they would just basically build them from these scraps of materials and knotting them together and they're beautiful rugs so for you that haven't seen this show and you said it a little earlier but he's been gone he he really doesn't know his son his son doesn't know him he's been gone the whole time so the whole family yeah. situation is very very awkward and you know uh, oh and we're see it we're gonna see it's gonna get oh, even yeah. more awkward yeah <laughs> no, pull up until you hear the bones crack. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, this Blu-ray, the fucking transfer is gorgeous. Yeah. I am so happy with this. Yeah. Uh, I got a lot of issues with a lot of transfers that Shout Factory has done compared to other companies. And if you do your research, you can really kind of find like the, what's going to get you your best image and everything. Um, and I'm not saying that all their releases are like that, but there are specific ones that I'm very disappointed in. But this one for sure is one of their finest transfers. The grain is still there, yeah. but not uh, not like overpowering. And they did just enough restoration to get rid of some of some obvious damage that was there before and things like that. But they left enough of it in that it still feels very much like what you would have seen on its premiere. And I, I love it. It's yeah. great. Yeah, it's the way it's intended to be seen. I, I think that's... Sometimes can can be a disservice to making an old film look too pristine because you ruin some of the magic of it. Well, and that some of the technology that they use for the grain removal or the noise removal, it yeah smooths out the image in such a way to where yeah. it looks it looks artificial yeah. and it looks like it's it's like pastel painted as, as opposed to being filmed. Right. It, it just doesn't look right, and there's a lot of those that have that. But they're starting to move away from that technology, technology, thankfully, with some of these transfers. It's just the earlier Blu-rays that really had too much of the digital noise reduction. And that's why some of us have been forced to double and triple dip on copies of Lucio Fulci's Zombie. <laughs> right. <laughs> God, this looks like the trailer I grew up in. Or, or the f- trailer my parents had until they saved up to be able to build a house oh, yeah. that I lived in. The paneling, the way that the the kitchen is laid out. And, I mean, it's like a ranch-style house. I was about to say, it's, oh, it's way th- bigger than, than the one I grew up in. <laughs> yeah. You can tell that cabinetry by the fridge right there. You can tell that is yeah. handmade, oh, yeah. custom. Without a doubt. Um, I have... I have some of that in my kitchen right now at my house because the previous owner built their own kitchen cabinetry and stuff, and it's very similar stuff like that. Yeah. And it's natural, beautiful wood as opposed to the paneling on the other side of that bar. <laughs> <laughs> hey, paneling was the new thing, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, in the late 70s, like, paneling was the shit. I mean, people sold it hard where they're like, yeah, you just take some old English and you got it. It's all good to go and everything. yeah. yeah. And I'm not completely opposed to um, wood paneling. I just prefer that if you're going to do it, do it right and get the individual boards. Right. You know, um, the big pieces of paneling for what they were at the time that they existed. Yeah, they were great, but it just it has a certain dated look to me oh, now. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, it was, you know, it was just structurized. You, hey, you can either have sheetrock or paneling, or you can do it the hard way. Well, and I can totally see where sheetrock would be kind of, you know, frowned upon because that's more of an office. That doesn't right. feel like a home. Whereas wood paneling, 
You definitely. I can't believe we're commenting on the decor, <laughs> but that's. I guess that's where my brain's going, right? I, uh, with, I don't want to deal with the darkness. I don't want to deal with it. Like I'm. I'm. It's like a defense mechanism because this is a real dark movie. Yeah, I mean, we're having to reestablish just lives here. I mean, during during the time apart, he's a different person. She's a different person. Well, and he was presumed dead. Like sure. let's not let's not mince words. Like yeah. they presumed they that the, all of these men that are returning today. Uh, in this, they were presumed dead for at least two or three years big, before any of this a happened. Big honking ashtray. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder people used to get murdered with those things. Look at that. I thought that was like a fucking uh, like a candy dish, but you're right. Look at the corners on it. That's got to be an ashtray. Oh yeah. That's for a heavy seven seven pack a day smoker, right? <laughs> Can. Oh, that's some dark stuff. Oh, yeah. You still with me, Rick? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm watching you, the movie. <laughs> you got drawn in the movie. Okay, just wanted to make sure. <laughs> well, yeah. we knew that dialogue was see, coming, the, right? Because this is a yeah. this is a, another pivot yeah. point. See, we both, got, we both got sucked in. We both just started <laughs> watching it. This actress's performance is so brilliant where she's like, I thought you were dead. Right. Like, that's... She's like, I, I finally caved and I was with another man. I'm only human. And it's... He doesn't blame her. No. And he's so comforting with it. Yeah. And... This is this is I would I the, I would attribute all of this the dialogue the way that these actors are playing it out this has to be how it was written by Schrader yeah because he's so good with these kind of complex emotions and things that people don't want to think about and deal with and it's weird to say that about the writer of Taxi Driver but it's true <laughs> because people always overlook the subtle individual interactions that Schrader put even into Taxi Driver yeah. I mean that whole entire movie the crux of that whole entire conversation is a calm conversation that he has with Jodie Foster's hooker right. and when he decides to go save that poor child prostitute from what's happening to her you know just because he has a casual conversation and he just kind of liked her so he decides it's time yeah <laughs> it's the whole crux of that film is that one quiet calm conversation and I, I would say the same with, with this yeah. because they're trying to figure out if they can make a go at it. She wants to, but she's being completely honest and got to respect that. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's showing you his character too. Even though what he's been through, he's he's understanding to a, to a degree, you know. Yeah, he's like, "Well, I would have assumed I was dead too. Yeah. I've been gone for like 7 or 8 years and even the government presumed I was dead. They stopped trying to find us." So you're saying no heroes welcome at home tonight. I see. Dang, man. Dude's got a feather duster for armpit hair. I'm a pretty furry beast myself too, but like, geez, man, that the <laughs> it's not like it's not volume, it's like just a certain patch of it and it's like really long like most people would have on their head hair on William Devane's chest. That's nuts. <laughs> So it's not that she doesn't want him in the bed with her. It's that he can't yeah. get comfortable in any other kind of bedroom, and he also can't sleep. Yeah. So he's he's just moved himself out into this garage area, and this is all his choice. Like, he's just that maladjusted, and he doesn't know what to do. And those flashbacks tell us everything about what he suffered right. very quickly and just visual indications. And you notice the, 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 the people that were, t uh, that were beating him and stuff, they had sheetrock. <laughs> <laughs> and look, see sheetrock in the office. Yeah. Like I said, that's the that was the big difference. I think that's why a lot of people went with paneling in their homes because it felt more Ho homey. Home yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was the same thing with like you know how they used to do the paneling, like the individual planks where they would have plank walling in cabins, mm -hmm. or you know like the log cabin look. It felt more like a home. Whereas opposed to a sheetrock was always reserved for like tenement or office buildings or maybe apartments. Yeah. Although I think apartments went with paneling after a while too in the seventies.
So is he still serving? Uh, well, I guess that was his, his commanding officer, I guess. Yeah, right? Like, I mean, he's technically still serving, right? Yeah. Well, that dude's stash, man. <laughs> I always wanted to grow the uh, the the badass martial arts instructor from <laughs> the Wu Tang type films, yeah. like Goatee. I've always wanted one of those, and then it just developed into a full beard over time. Uh, more or less, just tribute to one of my uncles that I lost because he always had a big, great, big, bushy beard. So after he passed, that's when I started growing it out. <laughs> to be the full beard, but I always loved that, <laughs> that that you know that that specific type of badass martial arts, and I tried to do the mustache into it too, where it was like the three prong beard, um, right. and I did that. I tried the handlebar like that guy had too, but I just that look never worked for me. You, you got to have a certain sense of humor about you to do that handlebar twist out like that because sure. it it has it has a little bit of fun and humor to it. Did you see the bracelet that she handed back to him? Yeah. There are some of those still uh, circulating around. I had one for a while, and you carry it as a remembrance mm. for someone who is still killed and or missing in action. Right. And he was declared somewhat both. And that was what that, that steel bracelet she handed back to him, yes. that was his name. That um, I think it was her that was carrying it in remembrance. Ah. Um I just love the fact I of, that I like it looking at the people in the background, all your extras, because this is the way my aunts looked back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The uh, polyester. I just outfits. I wanted to po- <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to point out the bracelet part of it um, yep. for the remembrance factor because it's they just kind of hand it off, and maybe at the time people would know what that was, but mm-hmm. all these years later, I don't think that's something that people would visually get. Well, right off the bat, you've got the the rubber bra- bracelets now that they hand out for certain things, you know, uh, cancer awareness, all these kind of things. So it's kind of the same idea, but. You know, it it a uh, little different when you're getting somebody's specific name, you know, to, to keep in your thoughts. Well, and um, I, it was a specific uh, missing in action, killed in action right. um, bracelet. It was more the missing in action ones that were the steel ones sure. to remember the name so that at least someone was thinking of them. And um, I I received one of those. I was handed one of those as a, as a not necessarily a gift, but like as a as a mark of, you know, I'm growing up now. And I was told the story about the person that was still missing in action. And I carried that bracelet for a while. I ended up passing it on. Um, I met the, I met someone that was in the family uh, of the person that that bracelet's name was on. So I, I I passed that on to their family, but I wore that bracelet um, daily. Uh, I would, I would wake up every morning and I would keep it on. And I, and if people asked me about it, I would tell them the story as best I could. Um, I think it's a really fitting tribute. There's like a whole culture behind that of, you know, we've lost this person. They're missing. We don't know what's happened to them in, you know, service to our country. We need to talk about them. I think it's, a, a you know, like a, it, not necessarily just a whole support your troops, but that was a human being and no one knows what happened to them. Right. <laughs> yeah. So this is the dude yeah. tapping his wife, yeah. <laughs> and he's like friends with They're them. Like, he's yeah, cool I with think it. They grew up being, you know, kind of best friends or whatever. Yeah, he looks like he could be the older brother from um, the more burly dude in TCM, the original uh-huh. TCM. Yeah. The yeah. <laughs> We're both watching it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, because we know it's coming up. <laughs> yep. Well, I was. This was what I was quoting. Is this scene yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> God, I got sucked in hardcore, and I know we're supposed to be talking about whatever just to keep the people occupied and happy. Can we talk about the collection of guns that are on the walls on the pegboards? Man. <laughs> Try to hold. Not happy about the pegboard holding them, but yeah. 
Imagine trying to hold one of those little, one of those long barreled pan guns and with one hand and not getting any kickback on that. <laughs> <laughs> look at that. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah those those look like Wild West style uh, <laughs> Colts, right? That top one, man. All right, so we're going to talk about the psychology behind this as to why he's showing him how to do this and why he wants to do this. Uh, I feel like he got to like yes. the rough treatment of what was happening to him. Like, really, really like it to the point where uh, he needs it to feel good again. Right. I think I think he found out some things about himself. Here, here it is. Tighter till the bones crack. Oh, God. Man. Yeah, it starts. It freaks his friend out. It creeps him well, yeah. out. But I think he he either he developed a taste for masochism with being tortured, or he discovered something in himself where he liked like the sadomasochistic lifestyle, and he was very masochistic, right? Or it, or and, it could be the rest of the isolation thing. It's it's it almost just the only thing. It probably made him feel like he was still alive. Yeah, that that could be too. Uh, and he's experiencing a lot of the same things. He's just going back to the same behavior that he had before. And he's he's yeah. clearly in need of serious mental health. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, he needs some serious, like, serious counseling to, to you know, work on his mental health for what's happened to him. And he's just abandoned and given, like, all these coins. Like $7,000, wasn't it, yeah. worth of, of, of silver, silver coins? Silver coins and a Cadillac. Yeah, one for every year he was gone and being tortured. But still, I mean, like, I can see where they want to do that. It's a good promotion for the company to give him that kind of money to try and, yeah, yeah. you know, get, get a better life started. And that fucking car, look at that Cadillac, <laughs> right? My dad, had, uh, my dad had one of those, but it was like a, almost a maroon color. My uh, father-in-law, uh, his... Caddy was the late '60s. This is a very '70s because of the curves. Yeah, you can see there's not curves; it's more boxy, yeah. and it has its. I can see where it has its uh, its love for that, but I prefer like the later '60s, like right before it started getting boxy, when the curves were mm -hmm. more subtle and they were rounded cars. But that's the version of the Cadillac that my father-in-law has, and it's white with red leather interior. Um, and he was sort of like working on it and restoring it for a good portion of his life. Uh, he's since passed. And just recently, my wife, her sister and my mother-in-law are uh, taking the car to get it restored and fixed and trying to bring it back to its former glory. Wow. Massive cars, man. Oh, yeah. That thing's a boat. I'll tell you what, though, like you don't feel a single thing on the oh, road because no, of how big and heavy it yeah. is. Yeah, I mean, it just drove like rode like a dream. Of course, that's that's the name, right? I mean, that's the whole point. That's the reason you wanted a Cadillac. <laughs> yeah, and she's definitely digging this car. So this was someone that apparently had a crush on him, and now she's all hidden, hidden on him, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that's. Part of how it is. I don't, I, that's not, I don't know if it's because... That's not his wife, right? No, it's right? definitely not his wife. <laughs> she seems like maybe she was babysat by him, and now that she's back, she wants to thank him for his service. Possibly, yeah. Wow. Oh, my God. Is that a macrame top, that lady's... No, yeah. no, it's just... <laughs> I've seen those in macrame. Yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> Where they just kind of like weave them together themselves. God, that is such a 70s fucking top. But that's still a look that people wear to this day, yeah. though. <laughs> she looks a little like uh, Christian uh, DeBoer or Kristen DeBoer, I think her name is. Hmm. She was... Um, 
I've never I've never really looked to see if she's been in anything else, but it it seems like to me I feel like I've seen her in something else, but I just can't place what it is. Yeah, I feel like I've seen her in a William Girdler film somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. There's something about that waitress and her like crazy red curly hair that's working for me. <laughs> She's kind of like a younger Mrs. Roper. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's what it is, because Mrs. Roper always kind of worked for me. Those kimonos, <laughs> my man. Yeah, let me get my Ray Bans on. And there hey. you go. <laughs> he's not into no, he's that. He's like, anymore. Uh, unless you got a rope and you can tie me up and hang me from the ceiling, I'm, I don't know. I'll pass. Dude, if this were my show, that'd be a total clip. <laughs> okay, so here we have a business with wood paneling because it's a bar, and they want you to feel like you're at home. Yeah, but, so, but this is so a, far our, our theory is working. But this paneling though is more that's more of a handcrafted type job there. Yep, the planks. That's the kind of thing I was talking yeah. about, where it would be like in the cabin where they do the diagonal, or or as I prefer the hen's tooth version. I like that. I like that look. A hen's tooth on the wall. This is where uh, Kelly Leak comes out on his motorcycle. Yeah, that's the baddest kid in seventh grade. <laughs> could we even do a Bad News Bears commentary? <laughs> Would that even be something we could Dude. do? <laughs> oh. I just watched it a couple of weeks ago, man. I just, I love that movie so much. You know, I, I know it might be blasphemy to say, but that remake with uh, Billy Bob Thornton was actually not bad. Yeah, it wasn't bad. It captured a lot of moments, you know, like in modern times, yeah. uh, really well. But I think, I mean, they didn't lose in that one, and that's the that's the problem. They yeah, needed to lose like lose. they did in the original. Yeah, yeah they have to because it's not it's not about whether they won that game or not. It's about them being able to get there. Yeah. And that's how they actually win, is they made it there. And just the, you know, who'd you get in a fight with? The seventh grade? Who? The seventh grade? You fought the whole seventh grade? Yeah. <laughs> Jackie O'Haley's amazing in the original. Oh, yeah. Harley's eight, Harley Davidson, does that turn you on? Now, after the years have gone by and I figured out that, you know, this is Roscoe from Dukes of Hazard. Yeah, that's totally Roscoe P. Coltrane. Yeah. I, I knew that right away. Yeah. Geek, geek. And it just, after watching it again, it's like, man, I, it's hard for me to see him as a bad guy, but ironically in the in his past, that's mainly what he did. Him being Roscoe in Dukes of Hazard was more of a one-off kind of thing. Well, he is so good and natural at comedy as well. Mm -hmm. I know that I know that uh, Dukes of Hazard's not a really a TV show that holds up to the test of oh, time no. with everything having to go with the with what's painted on the general Lee yeah. and that sort of shit. But I can remember watching it as a kid when that wasn't something that I was cognizant of, right. and loving his comedic stylings sure. as Roscoe. Like he he kind of carried that show, <laughs> right? But. Like, he's such a, a good, you know, he's got good timing, yeah. but him playing this role as the heavy, oh, yeah. like, he is menacing. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, he knows he's not the tough guy, but he also knows that he has the lack of compunction to carry on and to force these other guys to do this stuff. And they, they pick the wrong they guy to try and torture. the wrong dude, man. Oh, man, hit me harder so you hear the bones <laughs> crack. <laughs> like, just the way he screams higher at him in this. Like, yeah, it just, oh, yeah. that lives with me, yeah. you know? It's like the second thing I think of every time I see this movie. Because well, the first is coming up.
Roscoe also lost a little bit of weight when he was playing Roscoe mm-hmm. too, because he's a little bit heavier of a man yeah. here. Maybe he just was he got older, because you know sometimes you do <laughs> tend to thin out a little bit as you get a little older. That guy was in a the guy that just got up here. I think they called him Clem with the baseball cap yeah. on. I'm pretty sure that he played a heavy in uh, one of the Clint Eastwood movies. I can't remember off the top of my head. But I want to say, I think he was one of the white supremacist bad guy dudes that was in Pink Cadillac, maybe. That's possible. But yeah. like he he looked, like I know it's a Clint Eastwood movie, but I can't think off the top of my head. I've seen him play a heavy in Clint Eastwood films a couple times. Yep, see, he's reverting back to his training where he's being tortured. Yeah, I mean, he- God. Look at it. Like he's yeah, he's he's gone. He's gone. Like they, they can't Yeah. Is it just me or is Devane making this look like he's turning him on? The way that he's looking at them, like where he's like, Yeah, you got nothing. It's just yeah, he he plays that so like, it just feels greasy to me. Yeah, well, and that's the thing is, I mean, and that's why they're kind of running out of ideas, you know, because this is not what they intended to run <laughs> Yeah, into. they go right to this right off the bat. Yeah. They thought this would break them, you know. I love that they let this play out in your imagination because, like, it goes, he goes to a different place. And even though they're grinding up his hand, like he still is able yeah. until he passes out from the blood loss and the torture and the pain. Lou Askew is that guy. He was in uh The guy that I was trying to think yeah. of? Oh, you're looking it up. Okay. He's in uh, Easy Rider. He was in Cool Hand Luke. Okay, definitely would have known him from Cool Hand Luke. Watched that a ton with my dad. That was one of the prints, by the way, that was at the drive-in. <laughs> that they obviously didn't have the rights to play, but they played it anyway because it's the mountains who's going to stop them. He was in Frailty. Oh, that's a great flick, too. Oh, he was one man. of the bad guys, that the demons that gets collected. Right. Yeah. I got a lot. I I got to say I love the color palette in this. I don't know if they I would assume that they intentionally tried to match skin tone and and shirts and everything to the surroundings. But but also I'm sure it's, you know, this is Texas. So yeah, I mean this is maybe a l- I, I love the fact of <laughs> even though they're indoors, I mean, you're still seeing the sweat roll, you know. Right. It's yeah. this is yeah. you know. <laughs> it's like you said it's Texas. Man. Yeah. Honestly, I think the only thing that he really wants to seek vengeance for is the shooting at the end. Like, if they would have left well enough alone, I don't even think he would have done much with the police. I agree. Yep. So the family that he definitely lost but was trying to find some semblance of a life with gets taken from him they take his hand they take the money that he was awarded and he's not dealing with where he was emotionally and mentally with with his mental health he's not dealing with it at all he's just basically f- in a feedback loop of just yeah reliving these horrid moments of his life and just continuing to escalate to try and feel something close to that intensity yeah and and maybe even he's enjoying it in ways that he possibly shouldn't because there's a very there's a very serious undertone in this film to where he may be sexually into the violence and the torture yeah that happened yeah, to it him could, it could uh, it could go any direction with this and I think that's again what makes this movie so mesmerizing is like you said there's almost a point there when he's looking at them and they're beating him up to where he's like thank you sir may I have another you know. 
All right, my uh, my player just died, so I'm going to have to sync up with you here, but uh, we can keep talking about it. i got to try and get it to go. I tried to do um, views with the VLC, like VLC and uh, use um, a VLC program playing off of... I know what happened. I unplugged my <laughs> Blu-ray player. That's what happened. Uh, okay, hang on. The power came off, so hang on. Well, we're just having the conversation with where, you know, Tommy Lee Jones has come and seen him at the hospital, and they're just kind of chatting. Yeah, well, this is this is a part where, um, obviously, it's what are you going to do about right. it? Like, he needs to make a decision of to, yep. you know, as to he himself, what is, you know, what what's... what's What's the point at which I will seek the vengeance? Like, it's already going to be, there's going to be vengeance. They're going to do something about this. But it's a determination of, his friend is more or less feeling him out. Like, Tommy Lee Jones' character is like, well, what are we going to do? Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's funny, because we just, we, we spent the whole time pushing him out there. They sat on the bench for maybe 30 seconds, and then they go right back to pushing him back inside, so... Not a lot of dialogue there, but doesn't have to be. No, it's just enough to let you know what's going to happen. And then we, we see a lot of this, them basically just working the plan and figuring out what it is they're going to do. Uh, and it gets a little like a, a little bit of the military operation with what they're trying to do, too. Well, at this point, we're just, you know, uh, he's showing him the, the, the new claw. <laughs> How do you work it? You know, Tommy Lee Jones showing off that unibrow. And I, again, you know, William's character at this point, he, he's almost kind of got this happy go lucky thing now. After everything that's happened, he's like, oh, that's fine. Just come on in. It's, it's fine. Well, yeah, they got a mission, right? They got something to distract themselves from what they're dealing with internally. So that's, I think, it's almost like a relief. Like, uh, something that Bo always brought up in uh, when we were talking about, um, what's the, the movie I'm looking for? Billy Jack. It's another film very oh, yeah. much like a, yeah. a, a, not necessarily traumatized, but suffering from PTSD mm -hmm. uh, moments. Um where he's like, just give me a reason. You know, I'm just looking for an excuse here. You know, like, and that I want to do the violence. And that's what it is. He's at this point. Yeah. I can't believe I unplugged my Blu-ray player. What a dick. You should leave some of that in. <laughs> yeah, I was getting so excited, and I, I had it going across the floor under my feet, and I stepped on it, and it just disconnected on me. <laughs> so I really like that she's the one that's carried his bracelet, and it it's kind of... S somewhat hinted at that like they knew each other beforehand but yeah she was way too young and she's always kind of had a crush on him like do you get that sensation yeah, yeah, too? absolutely I, and I, I think there may even be a little conversation about that a little later on to some degree uh, i can't really remember but it seems like there is another connection there besides her just having the bracelet uh, and this is a really dark conversation the man that loves the loved the wife yeah. when she thought her original husband was gone and they try to sort out what's happening here. But I think he resents him a little bit because it's his fault in this guy's mind, too. Yeah. Smoking in a hospital bed. All right. That's the 70s for you. See, that's like Cliff should is reacting how you should be reacting and like, yeah. you know, acting like you should be acting whenever you were the victim of such horrendous violence. 
And it's almost like Devane's character. It just doesn't even register. No. It's just, yeah, we're going to get revenge. I just need to get better. I got to practice. I got to work yeah. on it. I got to focus. Yeah. That's all. And you think he's trying to talk the other guy out of it just because he knows that that's not, that's not the path that he needs to take. And this is, yeah, I mean, or, or is it more of a selfish thing? Like, this is my fight. Well, I'm going to do it. What? I think, you know, I think this is that thing of my life is already so screwed up. You don't need to mess up your life getting involved in this kind of stuff. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> it could be that, but I, I don't know, man. Like, he's got a real dark turn to his personality where yeah. maybe, maybe it is very much where he's like, no, man, this is uh, this is my game I'm playing. But, you're, you're not going to take my joy away. You already took my wife. a lot of it because <laughs> look who he goes to, right? I mean, he, he wants Tommy Lee, Lee Jones to, to be his partner on this, so they're the ones that know, you know. So they've they've been through all this other stuff before. So, yeah, but you get the sense, and the the conversations he and Tommy Lee have, it's literally like he's like, yeah, let's go kill some people. Right. Like he's yeah. already there. Yeah. yeah, he doesn't even need an excuse. He's just like, yeah, we're we're gonna get this done, and we'll do it because this is what we do. Right. And again, that goes back to him staying still being a part of this. You you can't let it go. We were having a conversation earlier about the guy playing Roscoe, who's one of the bad guys that we're going to be getting killed off later on, uh, being like, you know, a very good dramatic actor who just turned comedic. And I feel like Daphne Coleman's there as well. Yeah. Um, it's a strange career that he's had because, I mean, like most people recognize him like in the 80s comedies, like, for instance, yeah. uh, Nine, Nine to Five. five like, who? Like yeah. Yeah. But I mean, he had a very serious dramatic acting career, and sure. he's quite good. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think they have those kind of palm tree things in Texas, do they? <laughs> what are? Is that a Joshua tree in his yard? That's what, what is it that? Like. Yeah. I, okay, maybe they do. Yeah, it was somebody's yard. I mean, anybody can get any plant they want, right? <laughs> I don't know if I would want to per plant a p specific protected species on my property because then you have to like take care of it, right? A plant. <laughs> right. See, I don't know. There's still part of him that I think still feels for the loss of the wife yeah, and the child. Sure. Well, I mean, it's it's probably one of those things that kept him going throughout the war. So he made it through the war to get back to him, and then they were taken away. I mean, yeah, that makes you go grind your your. <laughs> this is this is definitely the scene that uh tarantino's yes. film logo is referencing right. where it's the you can see some of the sparks in the background and then it goes and rips the rolling thunder logo with the blood yeah never do that by the way when you're sawing off a shotgun that last little piece <laughs> where you break the edge off i'm not saying that you can't but if you do make sure you file it down Otherwise, uh, it makes it highly identifiable when you shoot someone with the buckshot because it will take pieces of that off <laughs> uh, whenever you break that metal off if you shoot someone. I'm not trying to tell people how to get away with murder with a sawed-off shotgun. I'm just trying to relay some things that I have So there you go. Him, him practicing yeah. putting the cigarettes in back in the, in the case was exactly so he could load bullets. Yep. Because if he can get individual cigarettes into a case, then he's going to learn how to load the gun. With the hook, yeah. There's a certain, uh, and I, I always bring up the samurai movies uh, in my film reviews whenever you have like these sort of revenge aspects or these mission type action films that we had in the 70s. Yep. But the one-armed swordsman yes. or the one-armed boxer or anything along those lines, there is a tradition of a great warrior who essentially wants to stop fighting, who has a grievous bodily injury that sends him on a path, not necessarily for vengeance, but more of a redemption possibly. Um, and I feel like this film taps into that a little bit too. And I, I think Schrader does a good job in the script of making it an Americana way. And I got to say, I love the high definition for that t-shirt she's wearing. It's super thin. <laughs> For a lot of these ladies, good lord, even in the background. Yeah. 
Yep, about to go down. <laughs> I love the part where she just pulls her hair off when she's like, we're going to go be sociable. And <laughs> she's like, yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> That's all you got to do. There's some serious ominous foreboding in these dark highway shots. Mm -hmm. I think it, it helps with the score. Man, it's a big car. <laughs> <laughs> so did he get... Did he get some intel that said that these guys, because I haven't really been paying a close part attention to the story because of our commentary. I've been focusing in on trying to think of things to talk about. Uh, but does he get intel he, that tells them a, that they're down, he, tells them they're down in Mexico? Well, he gets a lead on a guy, I think, that leads him to the guy that's got all the info of where the guys are. And they're crossing over, right? This yes. is Yeah, they're in Mexico, yeah. right? Yeah, this. Oh my God! I just, oh, I just started flashing back to some of the stuff that happens when they're down in Mexico. <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> yeah, it's perfect to not watch this for such a long time. Yeah, it's it's been a while for me too, man. But it's just one of those that as soon as somebody says something, there's there's about six or seven images that just pop in your head instantly. And yeah, the the hand being ground up in the yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> in the garbage disposal. Uh, pull up until the bones crack. Yeah. Um, the grinding of the hook to sharpen it and then the testing of it to make sure that it carves and that he can keep it strapped on while he's like slicing stuff well, with it. This, this whole back room this... scene that's coming up. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> All right. Just to double check, she just walked into the bar on me yep. and I'm at uh, 49, 33 ish, 34. Uh -huh. Cool. We're in sync then. I think having you do the start for the sync helps with the delay so we're at least in the same parts of the film still. Right. That <laughs> is. I like that <laughs> she wants to have a relationship with him in any way that he wants. Yeah. And she's not she's not pushing for sex from him. She's basically like, this is what we need to do to get you better. Then we're going to do this. And she becomes like an ally and like, a, you know, helps them with their fight. Yeah. She gathers intels. It's great. 70s magic. I'm really surprised somebody hasn't remade this. I just don't know if you could. There's so many things that are a certain touchstone of this specific era. Yeah, but, um, but you could. It, it would have to be it would have to be somebody coming back from like an Iraq or one of those type of conflicts. And even them, they wouldn't really be necessarily a long-term prisoner of war. I guess they could get taken by like a terrorist cell somewhere. But it, you, possibly. You don't necessarily have to make it modern time. You could still put it in the same time period. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Then you're just basically reshooting it shot for shot, and no, that's almost like psycho, Well, you don't right? have to do that either. I mean, you could you could kind of make it its own thing to a degree. I'm just surprised nobody has is, is what I'm getting at because... I mean, with Tarantino and the love of this movie and the influence it has on yeah. so many things he's done, it seems like an easy target. Oh, Ooh. God. Oh, that effect <laughs> is so good still. The blood. For a 70s film, the blood looks yeah. like real blood. Like so many 70s films, the blood looks like tempera paint. But that looked like real blood. Right. It still does. That's pretty fucking awesome. I knew that they set him up like like that uh that it was a setup where she was going to get dragged into the back room and he was going to do bad stuff. So this guy deserves everything that happens to him, but Oh yeah. But he totally used the girl and like she got pissed at him for this, you know. I thought she knew what was happening. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> I 
You know, and I think of you know all these movies that we're seeing now with the John Wicks and even Nobody, which which really was enjoyed. essentially John Wick with just it's a kind of, more middle aged man. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and humor, yeah. And, and I, you know, I, that's kind of the same area that this stuff is pulled from because it's that same thing of, you know, I've I've put this part of my life back, you know, locked up in a case, but once it's open. It's yeah, on, I'm thinking right? I'm back. That was his I'm thinking I'm back scene where he uh he hooks that guy's hand and interrogates him. Yeah. Yeah, he this is like this is almost as an egregious usage as like Texas Chainsaw 2 where a lefty has stretch play that on the radio to get her to be the next victim just so yeah. he can find them and and follow them back. Yep, yeah. Set the trap. That's totally yeah. what he did there. That's fucking shitty to her. You and me too, sister. (laughs) (laughs) I think she has a type, is what she's getting at. Man. The battle on that door that door panel. <laughs> yeah, that looks to me like they uh that was hand done. I got stuck watching the movie again. I got sucked in again. I like how we did. Did they talk about him being a lawman too earlier? Because I just now realized that he is a lawman. Well, no, he's the guy comes up and hugs him when he first lands. He's 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 standing there by his car, welcoming you home. You know, yeah. his family comes up. Yeah, it's been so long. I forgot so much of this stuff. And up oh, there's that shirt with that you know gift to us all in high definition. Oh, this is such a southern thing. The barbecue pit area. With the picnic tables all left out. I'm getting sucked in again, goddammit. I'm just listening to their dialogue. I definitely think that uh, Paul Schrader doesn't get enough appreciation for the character development he does through dialogue. Because it doesn't feel like expository where they tell you all these stories. It's literally the people getting to know each other And that's how we get to learn about the characters, too. You know, they don't just, like, all of a sudden talk about, you know, hey, you remember the time when, blah, blah, blah. 
<laughs> like you get in other movies. I'm looking for Fat Ed. <laughs> All right, now you're back. I can hear you better. At least she knows what she's getting herself into now when she's asking questions of all these people. You see what these guys are doing? <laughs> yeah, the car battery thing. Yeah. Hey, what My do you do for fun around here? Oh, we just uh, shock each other. Has. <laughs> yeah, that's like three car batteries. Look like they're wired in series to up the voltage, and they're seeing if they right. can handle the shock. <laughs> I was in electronics courses in high school, and we did shit like this, where we would use step-up transformers to see how much voltage we could take for shocks and things. The thing is the current. What's dangerous about this is car batteries are much more current. And shocking yourself with current from three different car batteries across both hands and having it go across your heart... Right. is really dumb and really dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so she's in... Did you say it was the drowning pool? I'm sorry, to because of the staticky stuff. Yeah, it's the drowning pool with Paul Newman. As a matter of fact, it was right before this movie. So pretty much the 70s, she had a... a a bunch of movies, like, clustered close to each other in the 70s, and then what... what Brew Anything Baker, Brew Baker in in eighty, and everything else is just kind of scattered. She was in Coffee. Oh God, yeah, we're gonna be covering that soon on Cinema Psyops. I've had that Blu-ray for like ever. We need to cover it. Yeah, not like my absolute favorite Pam Grier movie of all time, but I mean, it's still a Pam Grier movie. Still a classic, still right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Better than Sheba Baby. I think Sheba Baby be may, may be my least favorite of Pam Grier's work. Oh, look out. I love how he's using her, um, like, the, the fact that these guys are not going to perceive her as anything other than, like, a possible victim, and he uses that perception, and so does she. And then that's when he shows up and starts kicking some ass. Or getting thrown through some tables. <laughs> It's a pretty realistic bar fight because it is like it's kind of clumsy and, yeah. you know, he's just kind of reacting to the guys as they come in. I mean, it's it's definitely choreographed, but it looks seems like it's loosely choreographed because yeah. you really believe the actors are like, well, shit, I could get hit with this stuff. Well, chances are in realist in, in real life, the, the chances are probably very possible when you're making this style of movie. Yeah. The hook to the crotch is genius. <laughs> okay, so we were talking about the tradition of the um, egregious bodily harm to a great warrior, whether it's samurai or martial artists or whatever. 
and then they find a way to turn that to their strength for like the one arm boxer and various things like that. Right. Uh, I think William Devane's character by adding the hook onto the hand, that's the more Americana version. Sure. Because you would always have like, you know, in the Grindhouse films, there's the thing where the guy lost his hand and now he finds a way to, mm-hmm. you know, attach a weapon to it. You know, if you were going to go like a crazy Glickenhouse, you know, New York grindhouse type version it would be like he'd attach a flamethrower to his arm right he'd be <laughs> in- interchanging parts right you know yeah yeah he like would attach dr. like a <laughs> dr han on a kentucky fried movie right he's got a yeah. hair dryer and a vibrator and <laughs> <laughs> right like that's that's the, the 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 american way or uh like what they did with uh tarantino and rodriguez's grindhouse where they attached like yep. a a machine gun with like a rocket yep. launcher and shit to her leg or a mini gun or yep. whatever. Like that's very much grindhouse. And I think yep. there's the Japanese movie machine girl that does a great uh-huh. job with that exact same kind of idea. Yeah. That's awesome. But turning his prosthetic hook that he's going to have to live with into a weapon by sharpening it like that is pretty brilliant as well. And it's very simplistic and it's very believable that he would do this where he's like, well, I'm just going to have to practice with this anyway. Oh, you could see the, uh, like, right there in the reflection on the caddy's uh, fender, the back fender, Uh I could see the boom operator in the reflection. So now we're we're in too deep. So we're having the the revolt. But it's going to turn into, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to be your partner. (laughs) Yeah... I think she doesn't want to get into this level of what they're doing violence wise without it being for a a relationship or that support. And she does. She's starting to like love him almost. And I just don't, I don't think he's, I don't think he's together enough to be able to give that back to her. And he's basically just looking at it as ends to the means. And I think that's where that fight really comes in. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it got really violent. Like they're both very, very much like tossing each other around. Speaking of so- tossing each other around, <laughs> <laughs> listening to the radio in the rain in the backseat of the caddy. What's going to happen here? Yeah. So, for the question, everybody watching that hasn't seen this, how seventies does this get? <laughs> Maybe if they didn't listen to country all the time and listen to some rock and roll, maybe they wouldn't be so high strung all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fuck. Just like a couple, co- like just you know, like one to two chances of listening to Love Gun. You know, maybe you'd chill out a little bit. <laughs> all right, I'm feeling like a real fucking nasty pervert. <laughs> I just, like, I can't not see it. Like, that's all I'm looking at, and I feel like such a fucking dirty old man. It's just weird because, you know, in this time frame, I mean, you watch a lot of these movies, and that was pretty standard. And it's like, how did people just not go, uh, uh. the best, The best part is, is they didn't do anything about it for cable. So, like, you know, the resolution was low enough, but you could still kind of tell back in the day when this type of stuff would show up on cable. Well, and the camera's like looking right up her shirt in that sequence when she's laying the gun down. Jeez. Yeah, what do you think? I mean, she just picked up the shotgun and was shooting <laughs> out in the water. Obviously, she knows something. Yeah, she didn't even have to you know, really even, really even, it wasn't even much of a thing. Like she didn't even really have to brace for the gun or anything. And the actress is doing an excellent job. She's not wincing before she pulls the trigger and she's convincingly uh, firing each gun as if it is like second nature to her is what I was getting at. Yeah.
That's a loaded statement. She didn't like me very much because I was my father's favorite. Wonder what that means. <laughs> Up, she looked like she was flinching a little there, yeah, but they cut away. On that one. There, she got though. it now, though. Yeah. Jackie Chan has a great trick that he uses, um, so that he never looks like he's flinching when he pulls the trigger, like he notices other people do in movies sometimes. He fires the gun off in the air a couple times, like with the blanks, yeah. before he actually does his take, so that that he gets that that shock of what's. Yeah. yeah, like how loud's it going to be? Because once you fire it, it's not as bad. Because it's always the anticipation of how loud it's going to be that is more, you know, what makes you flinch or, or makes you get, like, kind of uncomfortable at first. And so he shoots it two or three times in the air. Then they roll the camera. He says, action or whatever, and boom, they're off. And that's why he always is able to fire the gun and not flinch on the shots when he's shooting guns, particularly in police story. I think that might be the one that I'm thinking about where he talks about doing it that way. Because he plays kind of a rough and tumble dude in police story. Right. Welcome to Del Rio. I feel like they should be playing ZZ Top as much as they're going back and across the border. <laughs> hey, curb service. How about that? I'm a big fan of curbside service. I hope that never goes away. Not having to go into places is like the greatest thing in the world for me. Just trying to figure out how that worked back then. <laughs> curb service? Yeah, what exactly is curb service? I mean, do you just pull up and honk your horn until somebody comes out? Usually you have to find where they're congregating on the side of the road, and then you pull up to the curb, and then you can get some service. <laughs> uh... Okay, so the next time I do this, I promise I will not step on the cord. I will get the Blu-ray's power cord out of the way so I don't do that again. <laughs> oh. Not a big deal. You got to leave it all in. That's funny for everybody. <laughs> Man, the detail in just, like, the shot with this old dilapidated fence, and you can see yeah. all the wood grain and everything. That's pretty cool. So is this guy the brother-in-law, or was he the, the... He's the... He's the cop that was banging his wife. Right. Like, an, okay, so... But he made it sound like he was, like, a brother-in-law earlier when he was talking to the other cop. So he's not necessarily on a vengeance quest. He wants to bring these guys to justice, is his thing. Or maybe he does want to kill them as well. But it feels like he's more pissed that he got cut out of this than anything. And he, he did get cut out because he's a cop. He didn't, you know, this guy wants de death. He wants to kill them yeah. all. Yeah, he wants and to it's, hurt it, them all. It's a mixed bag for the, for the police officer because this is his friend he grew up with. And, yeah, he was messing with his wife and had a relationship. But I'm sure it's a little bit of everything, right? He wants to see these people brought down. But he wants to make sure that this guy isn't, you know, crush them into a you know in a meat grinder or something either so well yeah you don't want your friend to be doing something that's going to get him sent to jail but at the same right. time you also want vengeance for your friend when something like this happens so i can see where he's conflicted right and devane's character it's almost like he's cutting him out not just because you know i'm going to go do this and it's going to screw up everybody's lives even worse it's going to be perpetuating the violence and make it worse it's more like I don't want to take the risk that you're going to, you know, develop a conscience because you're a cop and you're not right. going to want to do this. Yeah. I feel like that's why he's cutting him out more than anything. That's kind of what I was saying earlier. It's like he's wanting to cut him out for the fact of, look, I'm already screwed up. You're held together right now. If you get involved in something like this, it could really screw you up. And he doesn't want that to happen for him. Well, I'm thinking it's more practical than just like concern for his friend's well being. I think it's more like. You're a liability is what well, I'm yeah, saying on the other too. side. Sure. Because because you could develop a conscience and you could ruin this for me. And I don't that's want true. that to happen. Like, that's how I'm looking at it. That's true, too. Yeah. He just doesn't seem like he's that concerned about other people's feelings for most of this, <laughs> even before they grind <laughs> up his hand. <laughs> I mean, even with her, he's like, yeah, yeah, I used you. OK. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the that's the thing is it's like that's the most basic, like get to from point A to point B as quickly as possible 
yes. stuck in that world of the soldier and trying not to feel what it is that you're feeling and just keep getting the job done. Like it's toxic and it's it's going to eat yeah. him up. And she's really trying here, right? I mean <laughs> I mean, she can get anything she wants when she's doing what she's doing here. Like, like I've, I'm already sold, and I'm angry at William Defane for not, like, you know, participating a little bit more while she's kissing up on his face and stuff. <laughs> See, once again, I'm sold. Like, I'm in. Like, whatever she wants to do, I'm in. I'm, And he's just, like, laying there so disaffected. Like, how do you not react as an actor to this situation? Here we see the dilapidated yeah. place that Leatherface used to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how they would line the cows up for the hook and crook, man. That's, yeah. Just something about that grayed out, sun bleached wood mm -hmm. fence look that I, I really like. And like on a barn and everything like that where it's all grayed and weathered. Mm -hmm. It's character, man. It's, it's, it's real. <laughs> rustic is a good word for it too yeah <laughs> that's a dude that got his hand hooked right yeah Give him a 20, slap him, and tell him to tell you everything. <laughs> Although 10 bucks back then was like a 50. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you saw the sign a while ago when he stopped to get gas in the caddy. It was 90, uh, what was it, 49 cents? Yeah, 10 bucks would get you a, worth, a week worth of cigarettes and fucking booze for the night <laughs> back then. Yeah. Especially if you smoke seven packs a day, it would still get you a week's worth. Like those big ass ashtrays we saw earlier <laughs> at the main house. Man, some of that feels like a matte painting, but that's all real. Yeah, like, it's real. Yeah. Man. And that's totally what that is. That's what those stockyards are. They're for beef processing, and oh, yeah. this is clearly a plant that's closed down. But that's when they used to line everybody, they would line them all up and they'd have all these people just basically herding the cows into these like long maze like stockards where they would just have like channels of them. And then they just work them through and they bolt gun them now and shortly around this time back then. But it used to be like hammers and they just have lines of dudes just hammering leaves yep. in the head. <laughs> and that's this grim place that they're having this chase around that's now abandoned and it's gritty and dark and really works you know because there was a bunch of slaughter here before and it's in texas so what is the thing that i'm going to keep going back to but tcm <laughs> this is a great location man oh this feels like death wish too right where he's hunting a lot yeah. of those guys in those abandoned areas of la yeah Better get your 10 bucks back from that guy. That's wrong dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the guy, the 10 bucks guy. He got him. Now he can get his 10 bucks now back, Now he can get Ricky. your 10 bucks. <laughs> I was thinking more of like the tracing him for shooting the other dude. You can see William Defane's character is already doing a better job than the cop of finding the answers and killing his way to the truth, if you will. For getting all these guys. Mm. There you go. Got some determination in this cowboy cop. Crawling his way towards that gun even though he's shot and can't stand up. I kind of remember that guy when he was older in uh, Frailty, now that you mention it. Yeah. 
he has a Peter Fonda look about him. Yeah, yeah, like uh like a fucking Dollar General Peter Fonda, <laughs> right? Iron- and ironically, he was in Easy Rider with him, so it's kind of Yeah. Weird. Yeah, that totally makes sense. <laughs> He definitely has a very interesting face, and I, I would, I would think I would see him in some Sam Peckinpah movies. Yeah, you know, like maybe he right. would show up in uh, "Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia" or some shit. Yeah, this is. Yep. Yeah, this this is the conversation that really, yeah brings it home that he's not feeling anything so he's not thinking about other people it's more simplistic of just getting the job done and that's all he's got left now is that that soldiering on procedure that and he needs to keep doing it yep so this violence is just an excuse to be able to do that and i think they obviously have had sex right like otherwise she wouldn't be laying there in the shirt that he was wearing right yeah um, I like that this film moved away from that and we didn't actually have to see their characters do that. Which um, is very odd, believe it or not, for the 70s. Yeah, extremely so, I agree. Um, I yeah. think it was more a practical thing of how do they shoot him being handless or with the hook on when he's supposed to also be naked hmm. and having sex. That That's my thought as to why they maybe didn't do that. Or also maybe the age difference because he's, what, like 10, 15 years her senior in this? Yeah, possibly. Alaska. I just started watching Northern Exposure again. That show <laughs> shockingly holds up like you would not believe. Yeah, like that's great. The, the dialogue and everything. I just got through the pilot uh, not too long ago and... My wife just caught parts of it because I had it on while she was getting ready to take off for the night, go hang out with some friends, and uh, it suckered her in. Like, she wants to start watching the show with me now. (laughs) I just hit the cord again, but I didn't unplug it. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I, I fidget too much. I can't help he's, it. He's he's ready to go get back up. I think after they make love, this money isn't about that. It's about, you know, <laughs> you go you go get the life yep. and everything. But like I think after they make love, it's the first time he actually starts to feel something, which is why he tells her I'm here but I'm dead. Yeah. You know? Like yep. I'm here next to you but I'm also dead. Like it's Yeah, I, I can't I can't be what you need me to be, you know, for in this kind of relationship, so yeah, yeah, and he's just he's I, giving her away back home and you know all that stuff. So it's to me this feels like, and it's something that I kind of discuss a lot in in films and things like that, where it's like the Casablanca kind of syndrome, where it's like yeah. I'm not what you need, but I love right. you so much that I can recognize that you would have such a better life without me, and I want that for you. And you see it in Casablanca, and it's that kind of sacrifice. Of, of a character to do such a thing. And I, I think that's really a nice poignant thing. And it's a moment of redemption before William Devane goes off to do what he's he's going to do. But we're yeah. also sad about it for her because at this point, she's kind of the only character we can connect to because so many other people are emotionally dead right. in this movie. <laughs> or they're just fucking monsters like the people that took his hand and his wife and kid. Uh oh. I'm guessing him leaving might be more about to the way that she made him feel, where he thought that maybe they could have a life, but he needs to go do this vengeance, and he can't well, allow that to happen until this is done. There's that possibility. It's also the fact of, yeah, he doesn't know how this is going to work out if he even shows up on the other side of it. So here's your money. Go take care of yourself. And if I make it through, maybe I'll see you. Maybe I won't. Yeah. Look me up when I get to Alaska. (laughs) (laughs) 
Remember when it used to take three minutes to dial a number? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, I was a king of rotary phones. There, there was. I love those. Like that particular style of old, like rotary phone. We had one that was black with the handset, and uh -huh. uh, it was an even older version than that. It was like from the 1950s, and there was like a beautiful heavy weighted handset. It was one of those things where you could hit the side of it and make it pop up in the air and catch it. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and I was really good at doing that, and I missed that phone. <laughs> My grandparents had one of the first touch-tone phones that I ever saw, and I thought it was just the coolest thing ever, you know. Remember the touch-tones used to have that pulsing dial where you could press it, yep. but then it would do the pulse dial for you, yep. and you'd still have to wait the two to three minutes to dial the phone for the thing that... <laughs> yeah, you could still hear it, it it's still dialing the number, yeah. yeah. <laughs> God, we're old. We're, we sound like two really old men right now, my man. <laughs> Sally! God, Tommy. Sally, he <laughs> took the keys! He took the keys! <laughs> Yep, that is him. That's yeah, the guy that runs dude. the store in Chainsaw yeah, 2. It sure oh, is. Oh, hell. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And I'm covering TCM right now on my show as part of the end of my oh. year five. So it's perfect that I have all this uh, interaction yeah. with Texas. Tommy Lee Jones was a smolderingly good looking man in his youth. Jeez. Yeah, see, the, all these people are, like, just pratting on about all this everyday life stuff. Right, yeah. And these two guys, they just, they're not, they can't, yeah. they can't comprehend it. They're, they're not part of it. They're getting twitching. Yeah. It's particularly, Tommy Lee Jones is doing such a great job of, like, that, that intensity, like, that just, like, looking like at any moment they're going to just snap and, like, destroy yeah. everything in the room. Yeah. That's exactly like, like I said, some of my uncles that when they came back from Nam, I remember like as I was growing up, even in the late 70s, early 80s with them as a kid. Well, obviously I was born 79, but like through the 80s as a kid, I remember having that feeling where they're there, but like there's just this, this just un, unsettling, quiet presence with them at all times where yeah. it just, it just feels uncomfortable. And I think it's just because you've been marked by such intense experience. Like, you can't... Normal life just doesn't fit with you in phase. I will say that that uncle, you know, has since become feeling more pleasant to be around and has... I don't know if they sought any help or if maybe just with time they finally adjusted, but I remember it in, in my youth. Like, that's what it felt like. And see, he... I'm Barely I, I even love, says anything, and yeah, he's already yeah. loading up the pack, yeah. the gear. Like I love he's how ready simple it is. It's like, yeah, I need I need your help. You're gonna help ride with me. Yep, let's go. Look at that gun break away in the middle action <laughs> like that. That's a cool rifle. His tags. Yeah. It's a little exploitative, you know, sure. the way that they set sure. this up. But like, yeah, and not in a bad way. Like it just it's the simplicity of it where they're just like, we're gonna go do this now. <laughs> yeah he thinks he's gonna die and he wants to make sure he says goodbye to his father and that's it yeah this could be called toxic masculinity instead of rolling thunder because that's a lot <laughs> of what we're seeing here well they've been programmed man i mean this is this is what they're taught to be. Yeah, and they're they're suffering in silence in such a way, and yeah, it's so become ingrained in their identity. Yeah, uh, and all of the all of all of the yep. other complex emotions from their prison. You got pretty, Mark. Did you see that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder what is in a yucca putty market. I wonder if Yucca Putty is like the name of a a company that owns it. Yeah. Is 
I mean, I've heard of Yucca Flats, which is a location. Is Yucca Putty like another? Yeah. I, is a putty me. attract a land or something? Like what? I mean, when I think of putty, I think of like silly putty. Maybe it's a dude's name. <laughs> hey, I'm Yucca Putty. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that a gentleman in Yucca Putty could own a market, right? Yeah, you're right. Hell, it could be a lady that owns it, too. Absolutely. You remember old Miss Yucca Putty? Oh, yeah, the one that owned the market? <laughs> See? Works. <laughs> <clears throat> this grand old hotel, man. This yeah. looks like Narlins. It really does. This specific hotel with the sort of boardwalk uh, across the top for, like, the living which becomes like a uh, like a canopy for walking around the outside of the bar. It's the kind of place that you find Ricky at when he's not podcasting, folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not like that. Not not like a not like as a patron, but like he's playing. His band's playing somewhere in this bar. What I'm I've, I've played some rougher places than this, believe it or not. <laughs> you ever walk in and seen a place that's got chicken wire up across the stage? Fortunately, no, I have not. But oh, good. I, I know they Ooh. exist. Yeah. My dad used to run sound for bands and stuff when I was a kid, and he he's told me some stories of some of the bars that the bands that he like ran sound for uh. went to. Uh, when we were watching Blues Brothers and they had the chicken wire and that old oh, honky yeah. tonk, my dad's like, "Yeah, there are places that are like that. You see a place like that, it's best just to turn around and leave and break the contract and not get paid." <laughs> Damn, that's a good line. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not gonna argue. The price is the price. I would say that this is a house of ill, Ill repute. I'm starting to feel like this may possibly be. What do you, mean? you mean this is not just a bar? Huh. No. <laughs> I mean, like, they're discussing Price and her. I feel like this might be a brothel. I don't know. I think it's a stretch. I oh, mean, she, may, just, she may want to stretch before Tommy Jones. Screen doors. <laughs> that looks like somebody cut it to get in there. Or get out, maybe. Mm. Is this the first, like, nudity we're going to see in the film here with her once she gets paid? I think so, yeah. Like, over an hour into it already? Hour and a half? Like, we've got, like, nine-ish minutes left? Again, just, it, it's it's got some of the great 70s qualities, but it really throws you some curveballs on some stuff that is not the standard, you know, things that happen in 70s flicks, so... I just want to state that I would have asked her to leave those boots on. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Yeah, I think I would have been like, no, no, lady, leave the boots on. Yeah. Boots on, everything else can come off. Yeah, the color balancing on this particular blu-ray is really good too yeah yeah it looks good even the day for night scenes like uh the grass and everything like sometimes in day for night scenes you know how the grass takes on mm -hmm. a weird tint because they try to make that blue light look more like night right and I, this definitely feels like a day for night shot but it feels like I, you don't get like that kind of uh shadow cast from right. you know just ambient light like they're showing here so it's definitely day for night but it works it feels like it's a street light there's our first nudity in the film and thank you <laughs> are we drinking lone star beer here too as well is that what we got going on it wouldn't be you know a texas based movie without lone star <laughs> Hey, a vibrator back here on the table. Did you see? <laughs> no, I didn't see that. Yeah, with a can of Vaseline. Was it like an old school uh, there one you that had see the... it. Oh, yeah, I there. do see it. Yeah. That's the D-cell battery-operated version from the 70s. <laughs> that thing has like five or six D-cells in it, and it probably weighs more than my arm. <laughs> 
the ones that I, the ones that I always love seeing in the movies are the ones that have the external power supply, like that are like really <laughs> souped up. Right. Like Jesus, how do you lug that thing around when you're on vacation, lady? <laughs> it's got its own carrying case. For the discreet person in your life. About to go down. I would have liked to have seen them do a thing where he starts loading two shells at once with his hook. <laughs> that would have been a cool trick for them to be able to do. Better not let her get your pants off too much. Now, this is the only thing that I have a hard time believing because as a man, I don't know how anyone could multitask during sex like that. Eh? The motif of the men chanting from his torture playing in his mind yeah. as he's about to do yeah. violence or violence is done to him. Yeah. That's really well done. Up, oh, that's the second bout of female nudity, so thanks again, movie. Even though there's a bunch of violence in there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, see, we should have seen him loading two shells at once with a hook. Wouldn't that have been a cool visual? Man. I mean, this this movie just hit a whole different level at this point. Yeah. This is like the, the violence that Schrader was able to describe and get done with Taxi Driver. You definitely see it in this. Man, just, I mean, stabbing the guy in the neck with the, the knife and then throwing it out the window. Yeah. Slashing his throat. And they're wearing their soldier uniforms because to them this is the action. This is yeah. this is gonna yeah. be their final their final stand as soldiers, you know. Their last mission. Yep, that's a new set of nudity that we just got, so thanks again, movie. <laughs> Although Matt would probably argue that a guy getting shot in the scene doesn't mean we can enjoy it. The MPAA has a real problem with that too. Nudity and violence in the same shot. They yeah. hate that. This is a really effective shootout. Yeah. It feels it feels very butch and sundance, you know? But they've got the high ground. They just need to wait these guys out. Well, you can see they're not even they're they're, they're in control. You see how their uniforms have uh shell holders stitched in them now? Like yeah. his coat has a shell holder stitched into it. It's awesome. <laughs> that smile Tommy Lee's got. <laughs> it's the it, only man. time you see him smile in the movie, like at all. Yeah. Takes a little while to get here, but this shot, this shootout is very much like oh, yeah. going in, robbing the, or going into that uh, tenement building after killing Harvey Keitel out on the step. Or shooting Harvey Keitel out on the right. step in Taxi Driver. That ending sequence where it's just all of this explosive violence and it's so intense all at once. I just get the sensation that these guys wanted to die in a hail of bullets in this shootout. Like, oh, that's yeah. what they were they were expecting. Whether they get the guys or not, they, they knew they were going to be taken down. We got Roscoe, the man in charge already, and now this is the guy that ground his hand off. It's like he feels nothing with this mm -hmm. either. Yeah. It's just the practicality of, I'm just going to keep putting bullets in him until he's definitely dead. I don't know. You think that gut shot's nasty enough that he's going to basically bleed out? Real soon. I don't know. That's the thing that's so great about the seventies movies is the our, you know our, both our guys have got shot up here, and we yeah. have no idea just how bad it's going to be. 
but we get them walking off and that's it. Like they got what they <laughs> needed and we have no idea if they lived through this or not. Right. Like yeah. did they, did they have to do the typical revenge where they, you know, <laughs> they're I mean, walking your, off, but are they going to die? In your mind, you're thinking, okay, they're, they're going to make it, but you really don't know. I mean, it's, it's just wild. Yeah. Fantastic, man. Yeah. So Denny Brooks is the one who did the San Antonio. And this was, once again, like I said, it was used in, in uh, ninth configuration as well. This film is, oh, it's so incredible though. Yeah. So well done. And it's so powerful. And I'm really glad that I watched it while talking about it with you because it made it so much less of a bummer because it does, it brings you down. Oh, it's a, and it's a heavy flick, man. It really is. And a you lot know, we to think get, about. You, you get a, just a barrage of these films from this point into the eighties too. And they're all based off of returning from Vietnam. And that's how you get all your MIA flicks and all that stuff. that becomes a little more commercialized, but this was, this was kind of where everything was heading at this point And, I have to say it it did it better. It takes this long for really people to deal with what happened to a lot of the young men and women that were coming back from Vietnam and they were mistreated. They were spit on. They were called baby killer. And I mean, Rambo really hinted at that and tried to deal with that, particularly at the sequence at the very end when he's in the in the station and you actually see him feeling feelings again and not just being in the war mode that. Is right. like this this protective feeling, uh, and I f- it's I feel like Rolling Thunder does a really good job of showing that same kind of emotion and that same raw feeling and that drive that pushes someone to do something like this from the PTSD. I think they There's do some... it really really well, and, and I, I feel this film does it better <laughs> than what Rambo does in that sequence. Something else I missed too is credits only being about twenty five seconds long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's it. Like the the disc or whatever, it should have gone all the way, and, and we're we're out, everybody. Uh, that's that's the end of the movie. God, what an incredible film, though, huh? Yeah, man. Uh, it's it, to me, it's it, it, you never forget it. I mean, a lot of people. It's, it's one of those they probably pass over because you really don't know what you're getting with this. But hopefully, if you're tuning in to check this out, then obviously you're a fan. And if you're not, uh, I don't see how you can walk away from watching this movie and not going just how impressive it is. Well, Um, and the best part about this commentary is if anybody listened to it without watching the movie, yeah, we kind of give away plot points and we talk about certain things, but also, I mean, if we didn't sell you on it, if you're just listening to this without any other, you know, provocation, like as watching along or anything like that, like, I don't know how else we could sell you more on this film. Yeah. Yeah. It's so powerful. It's so well done. And it's just so overlooked and it's so criminal. (laughs) Yep. Totally agree, man. And I'm hoping that if if you're checking this out, if you're wanting to listen to this commentary and you don't have a copy of it, then send us a message because I'm planning on putting a backup version out there somebody that, somewhere that's synced up with an actual copy of the movie. That way, if you can't find it, we can help you with that too. The last time I was searching around for different things for us to do, I remember catching this on YouTube. Because it was a way huh. for us to both be able to watch it and in sync and know that we had the same copy. But in this case, we just both happen to own that Blu-ray. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I know it's out there. I, I've seen it out there before on YouTube. But I'm sure Shout Factory, when they had the rights, went after it a lot. But that doesn't mean that it didn't go back up. Because right. I think their rights have since lapsed from this older Blu-ray. Yeah, yeah I, I just, I, I really genuinely love the movies from this, this time period. And... You know, you, you've heard me say it on a lot of different shows is, you know, to me, even if a movie ain't that great, if they're showing me something I really haven't seen anywhere else, then then I'm very interested. And this one, just the same way that Death Dream delivers on coming back from war and you're a different person, this one does it on a more humanistic level of what somebody actually does go through. And, and wow, it's, it just shows you how, how messed up you can can be. It uh, it's it deals with things on a very realistic, very human yeah. level, and it gets down to the nitty gritty of what their day to day lives would even be like. And I, I know I keep singing his praises, but Schrader's really the only like filmmaker or at least uh, screenwriter that handles those kinds of complex characters, or is really interested in that and that minutia and that. The, the deeper meanings of these kinds of things. And right. really, 
only Schrader could get away with that and and do it. But also, I think it's the time frame that allows yes. a writer to explore those sort of things because people wanted more complex stories in the 70s. And part of the excess of the 80s crushed that. Everybody wanted just to feel good and always have a happy ending. And it kind of ruined some films to be pushed that way. I mean, you would never get a film where you don't know for sure if your heroes are dead or if they're going to live. Like, you see, like, the cops coming for them and maybe they're going to go to prison. Yeah. Sometimes you would see something along the lines of where um, they're there and um maybe they're they're on their way out and they're gonna they're gonna end up okay but you get the sense where they're happy and they try to make it seem like maybe they're gonna be okay um but this film doesn't do that they just they're walking out of the bar but they both are clearly bleeding quite a bit and they've been shot up and you don't know they're gonna probably die like i always just assumed that this was this was their hail of bullets but it just so happened that they have a chance of living they made it out yeah yeah which is kind of still an unhappy ending for them for them to survive here they're going to be unhappy right i mean they they were going in expecting to die and and, (laughs) uh you know so he said goodbye to his father because he wasn't thinking he was going to come back like that was his hope like he was hoping to die i think more so yeah i mean it's so powerful so powerful man killer flick (laughs) <laughs> all right so you got the next pick do you remember what it was that you're doing because this was my pick uh, i'm so glad we talked about I, it i brought up just because of nostalgia's sake because that was kind of where we kind of really crossed paths was bringing up demons oh yeah from, i can uh, totally you just want to hear me do the holy shit she's a friend of mine <laughs> during the every whole commentary day. <laughs> every day <laughs> but i tell you what folks i mean we've we've already have been mentioning to each other some some Really good surprises, I think. Uh, so I'm I'm looking forward to see where this kind of leads because the first two episodes were definitely in the same time period in the 70s. We had Abby and we did Switchblade Sisters. And uh, so you can kind of see where we're at as far <laughs> as our frame of mind of what we are cutting our teeth with here. But sky's the limit so for you people that are listening if if you're you know contributing to patreon and stuff and you've got suggestions that you want us to check out we're open to that i i think aren't we court yeah sure (laughs) why not i mean uh this patreon only feed is very much for us just to hang out and i think you and i can find something to talk about and just about anything somebody wants us to cover so I mean, I'm, I'm open to it. There's a few things where people are like, oh, you guys should watch Birdemic. I'm going to be like, nah, I'm not going to have some <laughs> good things to say about that. But yeah. like, it, I kind of want this to be more of a thing where you and I, and then maybe the audience, if they're interested, would be championing a film that we feel too many people overlooked. Absolutely. Because um, I feel like we definitely did that with Switchblade Sisters. Yes. Um, we found a way of doing that with Abby, although we were kind of just having fun at Abby's expense more than anything, because you can't take Abby too serious. <laughs> you just can't. <laughs> but uh, I, I like the idea, and and I would totally love to champion Demons with you very much the same and, and talk about sure. the parts of the filmmaking that I love and and really just kind of obsess over it. Um, yeah. and, I, and I think anybody that's heard the Hail Ming appearance that I did <laughs> um, with Demons and Demons 2 would probably want to hear us talk about Demons again anyway, oh, yeah. too. Oh, yeah. So that'll that'll definitely be a blast. And uh, so just keep checking this out because we're going to throw you some curveballs. Uh, like if this one wasn't enough. Uh, <laughs> if you well, like this pick, then we've got some definite, you know, uh, home runs for you coming up. And, geez, we kind of almost talked ourselves into doing a Bad News Bears commentary, too. <laughs> almost. Yeah. <laughs> I'd do that in a drop of a hat. <laughs> <laughs> there goes the baddest podcasters in all of Legion Podcast. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> awesome. Well, man, this has been a blast. And, and again, I just it, it, it's hard to say it's a blast when you went through a movie that really can drag you down. <laughs> But uh, I'm just, uh, to me, I feel like it's a little, a little bit of an accomplishment because this is one of those movies that, like you said, nobody gives enough credit to, nobody really talks about. So I think we've done a, a good service here. Yeah, it's definitely underappreciated. There are a few people here and there that talk about it, but um, with this day and age of, you know, revisiting films and people going back and consuming media from the past, and even when you view this film with, a more mindful thought of the way that people are trying to just basically care about each other and be more sensitive to 
the plight of your fellow man, you know, before you just judge them for who they are, you know, right. instead of using a term like shell shock to just be like, oh, yeah, clearly they've been to war and like just being dismissive of them as being a damaged human being. Now you can see them as the complex individual living the life yeah. that they are. And this film is so ahead of its time for that. And Absolutely. I love that. I love that it's more resonant nowadays and it makes more sense. And the exploitive elements that are there in the film almost take a backseat to the story that it's telling. Right. And that's so incredible because I can tell you watching it in earlier days, it was all about the exploitative elements, but there's so much more there under the surface. And yeah. that's the sign of a great exploitation movie. And, and again, that's what I was saying. The, the way that this movie is put together is really so different versus all the other 70s movies that you get because the things that you think are going to be exploited are not. Yes, we get some nudity there at the end, but guess what? You're in a brothel. I mean, you're going to get it, right? I mean, that's just <laughs> expected. But it really yeah. doesn't matter because you're not there to see that. You see it in passing because you know that <laughs> it, it, it's game on at that point. So uh, yeah. it's it's brilliant. It's a brilliant film. Yeah, it's really, really well made, and I'm I'm really glad that we did it. And I'm really looking forward to this being what Mental Rental is all about now, where we're really kind of digging in and... Uh, just kind of trying to champion the unappreciated stuff. And we could still have, you know, some movies that we can have some fun and poke at its expense. I guess it's kind of to our discretion. I just sure. hope that one of us isn't going to be loving on a film and the other one's going to be like, nah, <laughs> I'm not into this, man. But, like, well, that could be an interesting commentary in and of itself. It has to be an agreement, man. Why, why would you go through watching something you really don't want to watch? That's kind of not the point of doing this, right? So so yeah. next week when we do Meatballs 2, it's going to be fun. <laughs> I actually, I, I like meatballs too. I do, I do too. <laughs> I actually like meatballs too. See, that doesn't work. That jump doesn't work because we would totally have a blast doing meatballs too. Oh, uh, hey, put it on the list. <laughs> <laughs> this list just keeps getting longer if we're doing these once a month. <laughs> yep. That's all right. <laughs> well, I believe that's it for us, man. Court, you got anything else you want to add, buddy? Yeah, no, just uh, pull up. No, harder, harder until you hear the bones <laughs> start to crack. Oh. Oh. Still creeps me out, yeah. So if that's it, man, yeah. we will we will see y'all later. Thanks for hanging out with us. Adios. <laughs>